Good evening. Welcome to Science on Tap. Thank you all for coming. My name is Susan Knight. I work at UW Trout Lake Station. Um, up north here, just a little bit, uh, Science on Tap is an example of the Wisconsin idea, an idea started in 1905 that the borders of the university are the borders of the state. And we started Science on Tap not for you to get a lecture, but to hear a new topic and to be able to ask um, any questions that you have. So it's very much of a, a back and forth. Um, I want to remind you about our partners in Science on Tap. Um, we're at UW Trout Lake Station, Kemp Natural Resources Station, the Monaco Public Library, the Lakeland Badger Chapter of the Wisconsin Alumni Association, and of course our hosts here, the, um, the Monaco Brewing Company. So thanks to everybody. And Science on Tap is supported um, in part with a grant from the Brittingham Foundation um, on UW-Madison campus. And there are several ways you can watch our program. You can come right here, which is where you all are right now, which is great. Um, you can also go over to the Monaco Public Library. Uh, Mary Taylor always has root beer and pretzels, and you can watch right there. Um, we also have live streaming, so if any of you are away for the winter, you can still watch live. Just go to our website and click on uh, Watch Live and you can see us right there. And then you can watch uh, later as well. We archive all of our entire programs and then um, we also make about a five to 10 minute short version of each talk um, so that you can uh, just get a little sampling, a little bit of the, of the beginning part and then a little bit of the, the questions at the end. Um, our next Science on Tap will be October 4th and our topic will be sports injuries. Uh, which is a very timely topic and I'm sure will be interesting. Our speaker will be David Bell of the UW Department of Kinesiology. And our annual Science on Tap field trip is this Friday and is being led by our speaker tonight. Saturday. I'm sorry, thank you. Saturday, what did I say? It doesn't matter what I said, just pretend I didn't say it. Uh, it's on Saturday, thank you. And uh, we are leaving from the Campanile Center at uh, 8 a.m. sharp, so please be there at 7.45. It is pretty much full. If anybody still wants to go, we might have a seat or two. So uh, see me or see Hank um, after the program tonight. Uh, we, we do have just a couple of seats left. Um, but again, please be there about quarter of eight, and we are leaving very sh promptly at eight. We've got a long day. So. Uh, tonight we have The Future of Farming in Wisconsin with Dr. Paul Mitchell, Associate Professor um, in the Department of Agriculture and Applied Economics. Uh, Paul was born in Monona, Minnesota, but he grew up on a farm in uh, northeastern Iowa along the Mississippi and upper Iowa rivers, not far from La Crosse. He considers himself a child of the Driftless area. Paul graduated with, get this, a BA in History, and from Iowa State, and then went on to get a master's in classics from UW-Madison. And so though he grew up on a farm, you can see from his history and his classics degrees that uh, he wasn't quite ready for agriculture just then, but in his late 20s, decided that he needed to do something useful. So he went and got a PhD. <laughs> Not everybody thinks that's useful, but at any rate, he turned it into something. He got a PhD in economics from Iowa State University. He's been on the faculty at UW-Madison since 2004, where he's professor and extension state specialist in the Department of Agricultural and Applied Economics um, at UW-Madison. He's also the director of the Rink Agribusiness Institute and co-director of the Nutrient and Pest Management Program. His own research concerns um, crop production and the trade-offs and synergies between agriculture and the environment. His research emphasizes pest management, uh, that's insects, weeds, and pathogens, sustainability, and the economics of biotechnology. And like so many of our colleagues from Madison, Paul and his family often come up here into the Northwoods. Uh, they're campers and cross-country skiers, and they've visited the Northwoods many times with and without their kids, um, coming up in the fall for uh, hiking and kayaking or in the winter to cross-country ski out at Minocqua Winter Park. So he's an old hand up at the Monaco area. Old hand. Old hand. Not, old. not old. He's not old. <laughs> Experienced. Nicely aged. So here's your trivia question. 
When Paul was an undergraduate at Iowa State University studying ancient history and philosophy and learning to read Greek and Latin, he was offered the opportunity to be an undergraduate research assistant in an aquatic, in an aquatic ecology lab, of all things, studying agriculturally impacted streams and wetlands. Why did he quit his job at the library and take it? All right, three, three suggestions here. A, the chance to increase his wage all the way up to $6 an hour, which was a lot back then. B, to impress a young woman he was interested in who was a real granola environmentalist. Or C, because he was deeply interested in agriculture and the environment. B. I thought it was tricky. <laughs> you you saw it right through it. Welcome, Dr. Paul Mitchell. Thank you. Thank you. Um, they basically told me to kind of keep it low key, and I, I do a lot of extension talks, and so it's pretty. It, the one thing I will say, it's hard for me to see you all with the lights, and so um, you might have to wave a little bit to be, if you have, want to interrupt me or ask a question. Um, what I'm going to do is. Um, kind of spend a couple more minutes talking about what I do at University of Wisconsin, um, and then um, talk more about sort of sort of some big, I'll call them mega trends or whatever you want to call it, kind of in agriculture that's going on right now, some of which I'm working in and some of which I think matter to the state of Wisconsin and might be of interest to you all, and then move over into this kind of a discussion of what's going on, what can this, what's going on in agriculture, what can that mean for the Northwoods um, here as well as other areas up here. Um, Essentially, I have four, a four-way split. Um, faculty, most of the people you have come up here probably talk about doing teaching and research. Um, and I have those two. I teach an undergraduate class in, in farm management, and that's about a third of the students are from farm backgrounds. The other 40 students or so, um, 40, 45, are totally not from agriculture at all, but they're an ag business major, and they're, I have to explain agriculture to them. It's a real first exposure. It's sort of a junior level class. They take all those other courses and then they finally kind of get into the, the core curriculum and we talk about the farm, you know, what, what farmers are up to. Um, and so I, I, talk, I do that. I also do research and I'll talk more about that. And I do a lot of, she, um, Susan did a good job explaining most of the big things I work on there. Um, in extension, I do a lot of outreach, a lot of talks to farmers and ag professionals in the state and then you go, my pest management stuff, you talk to the EPA. I've actually, once I talked to the, the staffers at the Senate um, Ag and Environment and Public Works Committees. Um, so not the senators, but their staff. And if senators are smarter than representatives, but um, the representatives, I've heard they don't, the staff, the staff's what runs the show a lot of times. And they, when they actually, they tell what's really going on. And, um, and that's the Senate. Um, that was actually very interesting to learn from. Those, there's some good, sharp people there. Um, and then the last is, I do a lot of administration, and um, that's the thing, as a young person getting into these fields, you never realize, you know, they always tell you, someday your generation will run the world, and I had no idea that's what would happen, and it does, it's because everyone else retires and you're stuck doing the job. Um, and so, I, I, it was really hard, I do a lot of work, that's what I'm finding out, I sat down putting stuff together, and it's like, you know, man, no wonder I'm busy, I'm always, I got a lot to do. Um, but the one thing I've been finding myself doing more and more in the last, say, five years is, explaining agriculture to not people from non-ag backgrounds. That's become a large part of just another thing I do. And I seem to get a lot more phone calls and mess um, uh, people want to talk to do uh, magazine or newspaper articles and stuff or radio things. And, um, and like I said, that started with my students in that class and it's just grown from that. And I think I must be good at it because I get asked to do it more than um, I would expected. But it's also like I'm in a department of ag and applied economics a bunch of ag economists, I'm the only one from a farm background. Everyone else is from an urban background or suburban. Um, no, they're not from farms. I mean, it's, and that's the same way in the College of Ag and Life Science. A lot of the faculty are not from um, agricultural backgrounds. Um, but it's a two-way street. I have to, part of what I do is explain er, what the urban people, what do normal people, non-ag people w expect and think about agriculture, because a lot of farmers don't know that either. So I'm kind of in the middle between, and that's, I guess, my job as a a public employee. Um, what I want to talk about then are some, some of these five things that are kind of going on in agriculture right now, some of which I'm operating in, some of which I think matter up here um, or to the state of Wisconsin. The first one is gene editing. Um, it's a brand new thing in the last few years. The big one is CRISPR. I don't know what it stands for. It's all capitals. It's an acronym. There's some other methods. There's talons and zinc finger. There's these other terms. They're different ways. 
but all DNA is basically how we live. That's how we operate. Um, and those are all those four amino acids, and I forget the names of them. And you just repeat them over and over. And what gene editing does is you go in and edit individual amino acids to change the genome to whatever you want. And so, um, and it's going to be a big deal uh, it, in health. You can do, I mean, I'd already had a case, some kid was treated for something, um, some genetic disorder using gene editing. Um, but it's also going to be in agriculture now. Um, it's going to really make plant breeding uh, much more precise. It's, they can search the genome, find things, and do it without doing all the old methods where shooting genes in there, using gun, gold guns, and shooting little pellets of DNA in there. Um, random events. They used to use mutation using radiation to seeds to try to get changes. Now we can just go in and edit the genome. Um, it's going to be very precise. It's really going to change that stuff. Um, I, drought tolerance, cold tolerance, changing flavors and colors, qualities, um, disease resistance, all kinds of stuff. Um, but I don't work in that so much. I do work in insect um, and weed management a lot. And um, the one thing they're talking about is something called a gene drive. Um, and what a gene drive is, they do happen naturally. Um, and, you know, when you, you know, sexual reproducing species, um, you get half your DNA from your mom, half your DNA from your dad. That's just how it works. Um, and so you have a 50% chance of getting stuff. Well, what this gene drive does is if one of the parents has it, your kids all have it, and their kids will all have it, and their kids will all have it. And it's just like super um, inheritability. It all, they all get it. Um, and so what they want to do is go in and gene edit um, change the species and then release it in the breeding population and all the children and children's children and children, et cetera, will have it. Pretty soon the whole population's that way. They want to do it so things like mosquitoes are no longer able to transmit diseases. They're the big one. They want to knock out is malaria. Um, now, because what they do is they bite an infected person, go over here and bite another person, they take a little bit of spit with them, a little bit of blood, and that's what transmits the virus. And then, boom, the next person's got malaria. They want to, malaria is a horrible disease. 200 million people a year get it. 650,000 people die a year or something like that. It's just a huge number. The other ones are much smaller, but they want to eliminate those. And locally, it would be things like Lyme disease. Eventually, we'll get to eliminating, eliminating it from the tick population. Um, they want to use that for agriculture. Um, I don't know how many of you are aware, but HLB is it's called Huanglong Bin virus, or Huanglong Bin. It's a citrus greening. It's basically decimating the world's citrus industry. Florida citrus is like at 25% of its acres it was like a decade ago because it, this, this insect, citrus psyllid, is just like malaria. It transmits this disease between trees, kills the, the trees die over a few years. And it's just, it is gonna get, it's getting into California now. Um, that's where all your fresh fruit, um, fresh citrus comes from. Um, it's Florida's more juice, so they can kind of hide it. Um, but you can't hide it when you look at the fruit. Um, um, and also spotted wing drosophila is an invasive species. A lot of the berry crops um, are affected by that. It's a new species that came in. They want to use that to eliminate it or make it so it can't puncture the fruit. It, it lays its eggs. It's a fly. It lays its eggs in soft fruit like berries and cherries. And then the maggots grow and make little new babies. Um, and, and, and the fruit. And Well, nobody wants to eat fruit with maggots in it. Um, and so it's kind of a big deal to those guys. So they spray a lot of insecticides. The same with the HLB. They spray a lot of insecticides. Um, they want to do that for agriculture. That's coming. Um, the other big one is something called RNA interference. When you DNA, they unzip it, and then RNA makes copies of things and then moves off and makes proteins and enzymes and all the stuff that keeps us alive. Um, what they can do now is take a piece of RNA um, that will match in there. It'll match, and it's called RNA interference. And so when the piece of RNA would normally hook onto this spot in the DNA and get the copy, this other piece plops in there and matches it, and it doesn't let the other piece in. So now it shuts off. No longer can it make that enzyme. And the key is, because each species is different, has different DNA, you can make a, a piece of RNA interference molecule that will only affect one species. And they've just this summer in June, Monsanto got RNAi for corn rootworm, western corn rootworm, approved. Um, it's still another, until the end of the decade before it's actually in the field as a commercially available thing. But... It only affects that species. It won't affect anything else. I mean, that's that specific, and it'll keep. It'll knock out some protein pathway, and then it will. It'll. It'll be gone. Um, and we've been working on some of that. I just got a paper. Literally, we finished up the edits um, last week on Friday. Friday. Um, thinking about this, they all spend. All the scientists are so worried. You got to get all these uncertainties about what is this gene drive going to do in the environment? What's it going to do ecologically? Will it work in a real population? And I'm going, you know, I'm a social scientist. It's like there's a lot more going on than just 
these biological and ecological uncertainties. There's a ton of social uncertainties as well. The social, social stuff matters. That's half of what I feel like I do sometimes, explain why social stuff matters. It's not just science, um, you know, the, the environment and the, the, the lab people. Um, and it's basically regulation will affect public perceptions. Public perceptions will affect regulation, and that will affect commercialization. Uh, to be honest, why we have all these big biotech crops in corn and soybeans? Because it costs so much money to get them a approved and produced, and they have to wait a decade. The numbers I've seen are 250 to $300 million invested to get a new BT corn product, and it takes 10 years at least before you start getting return on that investment. Well, you're only going to do that in big crops where you can recover a quarter billion dollars waiting 10 years. You know, that's a big investment. You're not going to get, you know, fancy new eggplants or something like that. You're only going to get corn and soybeans. Um, so that stuff's coming. I, like I said, I've been working on that a little bit. Mostly we're going to be doing a survey. If any of you get a survey about what you think about gene drives, you probably shouldn't answer it because you've been polluted by, contaminated by hearing me talk about a little bit about it. Um, we'll be doing a survey sometime this fall, um, a more of a public opinion survey nationally. The big other thing is big data is coming. Um, you've all heard about big data, and ag has been collecting piles of information, and nobody knows what to do with it yet. It's happening the same thing in medicine. Um, we're right by Madison is Epic, and actually I found out UW is a big center for like health informatics, um, and then they want to plop it over to the ecological and the agricultural side. Um, and I've worked, I've just been starting to work on that, and that's a very, we just have a lot of information. Nobody knows what to do with it, literally. They, you do the simple stuff, look at your yield maps, and then, okay, there's a bad spot there. Oh, that's because blah, 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 you can fix it. But then after that, they don't know what to do with it. And I've talked to farmers. They have buckets where they just take all their flash drives or thumb drives, a whole bunch of information. Every few weeks, they get it, oh, throw it in the bucket. And they just have buckets of this information. They don't know what to do with it yet. We're starting to work on that. Um, we have a project with the cranberry growers. Um, I probably actually, I found out, I didn't realize it this far north. Um, might be some from around here. Like 100 variables for each little marsh, little three, four acre marshes. And then we want to go back for 15 years and start looking for ways to make management information from that. You can actually do something with. That's coming, and that's going to bring a lot of efficiency, reduction in pesticide use, nutrient use that you don't need. Um, and that's, there's a lot of methods. And frankly, I have a grad student that does it all because I, I can't understand what he does. He does this machine learning stuff, and he does all this. He's a computer science econ major, and I, I don't know what he's doing. I know the big picture, but not the <laughs> programming. I, I really, I just say, do this. And he says, okay, do, 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 and he comes back. Okay, great. Um, third is large dairies are coming um, to the U.S. and to Wisconsin. Um, some of you might be aware of what's going on in the state. You know, we've got these larger dairies, three, four, five, six thousand, eight thousand cow dairies here in Wisconsin and coming around all around the country. I don't work in this area, but they're coming. Um, I've seen the number. I've looked at the research. A lot of things, it's economies of scale. You start out with, you know, you only got 10, 15, 20, 30 cows. Your cost to make a gallon or 100 weight of milk is a certain number of dollars. Then as you expand, you gain efficiencies. You spread out fixed costs over more and more units, and the cost comes down. Well, I guess from your side. High cost, we have low numbers. Then as you add, increase the number of cows, the cost falls. That's economies of scale. Um, what happens in dairy, those keep dropping as we get larger and larger. And I've seen the numbers. You go to something like corn and soybeans, crop fields, it doesn't fall that fast. Um, and so there's, there's kind of an upper limit. Going from 3,000 acres to 5,000 acres, adding a couple thousand more acres, doesn't really gain you that much in a lot of these crops. Because you still, you got to drive further. And it's just, it just, it doesn't help. After going from 2,000 to 4,000 cows, you can drop your cost because there's a lot more efficiencies gained in manure management and feed and things like that. Um, and they're coming. Um, nationally, we have some, not even quite 10 million cows in the U.S. And the, the numbers are, you know, that means if everybody on average has 2,000 cows, that's only 4,500 dairies in the, in the country. And then if everyone has 4,000 cows, it's half that, 2,200. You get 6,000 cows, um, that you're talking 1,100 dairies in the country. Um, three, 400 of them in the state of Wisconsin is all you'd need, and that'd be it. And we've done that already in other, in other industries. You know, there's not a lot of orange growers. There's not a lot of carrot growers. Someday, I think the numbers, the, there's just strong economic forces pushing towards these larger dairies because the cost keeps coming down. People respond to prices. Um, sort of the only alternative to stay smaller is organic maybe. Um, some of the grazers do it, but economies of scales will apply to those industries as well. Um, eventually, we can have mega organic dairies or mega 
um, as long as it depends on, you know, where the limit is, how fast it keeps dropping and how long. Um, fourth trend is population and income growth. Um, and I'm sure you all heard, 7 billion people, we got 10 billion or some big number, you know, the rate of growth has been slowing, but we're getting, there's just more people. And the reality is, is the, um, we'll top out, you know, 10, 11 billion or something like that. And the big one, though, is, is the, um, it's not so much the population growth is that the people are having more money. Um, you might not be aware of this, but um, like China is the world's largest or second largest. I don't remember if India's bigger or not in terms of people. They have moved 300 million people from poverty into the middle class over about the last 30, 40 years. Never happened in the history of the world. That's the, our population is roughly 300 million in this country. We're a little over. That's like taking everyone in the U.S. is poor, and now we're all middle class over like 30 years. Never been done. And I was over there, and you, just every, you got all these 20, 30 story buildings everywhere um, that are like two years old, you know, five years old. They've got their other problems and stuff, but they've done something that's never been done, moved all those people out of poverty into the middle class. And then you talk to them, and they said, well, we've got a billion more to go. Um, we got another billion more people to move from poverty into the middle class. But this has been happening around the world. Um, I remember watching the news a few years ago, and you remember that there was some terrorist attack in Kenya, and they captured a bunch of people and stuff, and it was at a mall. And I'm, I, the part I stuck is going, there's malls in Kenya? I mean, that's the part I was struck by. Is I thought that was like this Western thing. Um, that's what I mean. The world is developing, and these, that basically means demand. It's not so much more people as much as they all have money and they want better things. Um, they don't want rice. They want something more vegetables, more fruits, more meat. Um, and that's going to be a big push. But you hear a lot of push about, oh, we got to grow more food. Well, the reality is the U.S. is the world's largest corn producer. Next nation in terms of total bushels produced is China. But their yields are literally half of ours. The average yield in the U.S. and the average yield in China. The average yield in China is half of what ours are. And where the growth and how we're going to feed all these people is going to be taking countries like China, Brazil, and Argentina and increasing their yields. Our yields are going to go up, but there's going to, that's where the gains are to be made. There's a lot more benefit. Um, Brazil and Argentina, it's not, they have lower yields. They'll grow their yields, but it's infrastructure. They don't have a way to haul it from the fields to get it to the market to ship out or something like that. They've got to get better railroads, better roads, better shipping port facilities and things like that. But um, and a lot of this stuff will depend on the social upheaval. I don't know, you guys watch the news, and I'm a little nervous about um, the whole North Korea, why are we going to have a world war type of thing. That will change things. That whole social upheaval can totally throw all these trends off on population and income growth and everything. Um, but a lot of that is, it shows up, you don't see it as much as it's the price. The price is the signal that tells a farmer how much corn to plant, how much soybeans to plant, how much wheat to plant, or plant something else. Um, and we've we had that price boom a few years ago. Um, we added 3 million acres of crops uh, in the U.S. cropland, most of it corn. This is nationally. Wisconsin only has 5 million acres of corn, so imagine going from hardly any corn to what we have. Um, and it's up in the Dakotas. It's up in um, Manitoba. Canada went from being a corn importer to a corn exporter during that time period. And that's where you start to worry about the North Woods. It could be potentially be turnable into cropland. Um, the, supposedly, the lower peninsula of Michigan, is the crops have been moving north there. Um, and that's where you kind of get into that big fifth trend is climate change. You can talk about the politics you want. I don't care. Um, it's more, it's happening. The weather's changing. You can argue about whether, it, who does it or why, if it's human caused or not. Um, you talk to farmers. We've done a survey. Um, you, I, we got it published. It, and farmers don't think climate change is scientifically proven. But they're sure the weather's changing, and they don't really don't. It's not so much an issue to them as we'll just adapt. Well, what does that mean? What are you going to do? We'll change the crops to grow. We'll change the. Um, we'll use slightly different technology. You know, maybe um, you know irrigation, um, and then there'll be more um, things like crop insurance and relying on sort of those kind of programs, insurance or changing the leasing structures and stuff like that, or simply just move, stop growing the crop and move somewhere else. And that's kind of what we saw in that last. The, we lost four million acres in the south and added 7 million acres up north in crops during that real high price period with corn and soybeans got so high, wheat. Um, net gain was 3 million acres, but more than anything, it was a movement out of the south up to the north. And that corn belt has been pushing north. And so that's partly climate change. There's more to it than that. Um, and, and so I think that's it's a real issue in the sense that it can make um, agriculture or different kinds of agriculture profitable in places like this. 
And that's the pressure you're going to face. Um, it really depends on the soil and water. Um, these sandy soils around here in this part are very useful for certain things. The central sands in Wisconsin, sort of like south of Stevens Point down to, say, Portage in that area, was essentially like a wasteland. Not much was going on there until after World War II when all that aluminum making airplanes and stuff, we figured out, oh, we can make tubes. And then they made tubing to move water around. And all of a sudden now sprinkler irrigation became practical. And you can see across the U.S. a whole bunch of areas became irrigated. Um, Central Sands is one of them. Now it's home to our potato and vegetable industry. Um, and there's a lot of... Um, uh, that's like a what's that? It's like a six billion dollar industry. Once you get into all the processing and everything, and it's like twenty five thousand jobs from that industry in that area, um, and that could happen up here if we want that or it's what you want. Um, it's just sort of a it's sort of a the prices drive a lot of that. But I did the math. I just got a thing in the Badger um, Commentator. It's their magazine, and it's like one hundred thirty two acre pivot for potatoes and processing vegetable. Once you include the processing side of it, not just the production of the potatoes or the processing vegetables, one, one pivot means two jobs and $430,000 of economic activity in the, in the area, in the state. Um, and so you kind of get in this, what are we going to do? Um, and then once you, you know, down there, it's all been a fight about water quantity. You pump these high-capacity wells, you do enough of them, the water table drops a little bit. It doesn't take much. Um, you know, there's, there's like 80, 90 feet of water, so we get plenty of moisture. It's just that top goes down a few feet. Depends. Each year it's different. Um, it already naturally varies, sort of separating out high-capacity wells from the natural variation. But there, the lake levels change. The streams change. Um, and that would potentially happen up here if you start pumping wells um, for crops or for running dairies. Um, and then once you solve that issue, quantity issue, then you turn into water quality issue. Um, agriculture is a leaky ecosystem. That's the way it was described to me as a graduate student. Um, ag leaks. There's always a little bit of, you disturb the soil, you're moving things around, the nutrients change, pesticides, um, all that stuff. It just moves. It just always a little bit leaks out. Um, so I guess up here, I think technically I could get agriculture up here in more traditional row crop sense. Just change the breeding so it can take the differences in light, and they've already done that to put corn and soybeans in the Dakotas. Um, it just comes down to water, and your soils would have to be amended. I think they're, they're acidic up here, um, the sands. But you can grow a lot of things in sands, just add water, um, and then add some nutrients, and you've got a crop. Um, and so that gets back to this last point, I guess, and it's, what are we going to do about this? Do you want this or not? Um, you know, where, I always think about this. I remember one time we were on vacation in Montana, and this guy said something sitting in the bar, and uh, just, it stayed with me. Look around our world. Everything we call modern physical culture, the tables, the floors, the clothes we wear, the stuff we eat, the vehicles we drive, etc., comes from two places. We dig it out of the ground or we grow it. That's pretty much all of our material culture. That's where it comes from. We dig it out of the ground or we grow it. I can't, I have a hard time finding something that doesn't really fit that. So then the question is, if we like having modern culture, where are you going to dig it out of the ground? Where are you going to grow it? Um, that has to come from somewhere. And prices tell us that. Um, where do you want to put different things? And, um, but you always have to, where are you going to put this stuff? Where are you going to put your digging? Where are you going to put your growing at? Um, and then you have to ask yourself, do you want it in the North Woods or not? There are jobs, but there's also things up here that are much different that are also beneficial. I think, you know, recreation and some of these other, there's forestry, that's is another raw, you know, we grow wood and we use wood and wood fibers for lots of different things. Um, there's that whole side of things. And... Um, and that's, is it better to use this for forestry and recreation or for agriculture? Prices is what we usually tell ourselves. We don't run around command and control everybody what to do. We let prices and markets decide for us. But um, like I said, two jobs and $430,000 of economic activity from a pivot for doing potatoes and processing vegetables, sweet corn and green beans and stuff. What do lodges and lakes generate? You know, is there going to be a compare? Are you guys someday up here going to have to make these choices? If, and this is a big if, the choices between agriculture and recreation, you're going to have to make some choices. And climate change can, might make some of this agricultural stuff more valuable up here. And that's back to what do you want the Northwoods to be? It kind of depends in part on the demands for recreation versus the demands for food and forestry and stuff. But can you have both? I don't know. I'll let you guys. And, um, I, and how do you stop things that you don't want from happening? Um, I was just on the way up here from Madison today. 
you know, there's some, there's some debate about mining. They're passing some mining bill, and they're, one of the things is using state regulations to override local control. They did the same thing with the windmills and stuff like that. That's always, it happens in every state. You don't want all the municipalities, each little government section, whatever it is, passing different rules because companies, businesses, they hate that because you go from one, you cross one little political boundary from one township to the next, and now the rules are all different. And it kind of, it, so the state comes in and levels them. Well, that means some of the, you lose local control. Um, and what they want in Madison, what they want in Milwaukee might not be what you want up here. Um, having a plan with broad community support helps, I think, and it's zoning laws, land trusts. Door County has a lot of land trusts to try to keep that land out of development so you don't have big hotels and stuff. Um, then you, or you, maybe you want some of these certain things. You have to have incentive programs to get certain things you want. And I, that's, that's kind of it. I'm done. That's my discussion right there. <laughs> so I talked about big trends, gene editing, some of these new pest control things, jet gene drives for human and um, plant issues, crop diseases, um, big data. I could talk more about what I'm doing there. Big dairies, are, the economics is really pushing, though. That's going to happen. It doesn't have to be here or there. Climate change and then this overall income and population growth globally is happening. Um, and it will put pressure on this region to respond to those issues. I don't know if it's changing the genes or so that the uh, insects don't transmit certain yeah, things. Yeah, yeah. Is this going to cut the use of pesticides? Yeah, that's the. Qu I guess you guys heard the question about how does these new methods change the use of insecticides? Um, Go back to like um, citrus down in Florida or the spotted wing drosophila up here at the berry growers and the cherry growers. They don't have any options, so they spray a lot of insecticides. That's their only way of dealing with that. Um, citrus was almost an organic system in terms of pesticides because why we use citrus for cleaning and stuff, that oil, that smell, that actually is sort of a, that keeps insects away. That's kind of one of its, its things. Um, well, it doesn't work anymore. And so that's why citrus was pretty resistant to most, a lot of things. Now all of a sudden this insect is transmitting the disease, boom, you just got trees dying all over the place and people quitting and they're growing other things. Um, and so there's been a lot of work on do GMO, GM crops affect how they affect insecticide use, herbicide use, and et cetera. And it's, you sit around and argue about it, debate it, but it seems to be showing that there's a decline right now. Um, and, People don't believe this, but there's an article in Science, or news part, and art, Science is sort of like the big name journal in Science. Um, and basically, show, I, where do you think some of the big insecticide users are right now? Developing nations, you think Africa's got really high use in some parts of Asia. Europeans use a lot of insecticides. It, people don't believe it, but it's like, look at, wow, the Netherlands, there's a lot of insecticides going on, um, and herbicides, it's not just insecticides. It's because they don't use GM crops. I mean, that's a fact of them. It, but GM crops can also bring in other problems that do then bring back the pesticides. Resistance happens. And so it's always a, you know, the one-handed economist would be great. Um, it depends. Um, yes, they do increase insecticide use. Yes, they do reduce insecticide use. Depends on the context. And in general, farmers like them because they move away from using um, insecticides to, pest, uh, to genetics to manage these problems. And this gene editing is so much more precise and they think it'll be even more along that trend of using less or using safer ways of managing these insects. Um, they, the farmers are excited about the options. And think about this way, what would you do? I mean, we were just went out this weekend on, on Monday. Um, it's the, one of the reasons you use a lot of insecticides in, is it's just common sense. You go in the woods, you get up there and we, we're sitting in the parking lot getting ready to go on this hike. Here come these people to show up, and then what do they do? Let's put on repellent. They all spray themselves with repellent, and then off they go. And we're like, no, nah, we're not going to do that. We'll see. You know, it's been kind of dry. We'll be okay. And we walk. We there was no bugs. I mean, we, there was a few buzzing, just buzzing away, and they're gone. But if you put on insecticides or spray yourself with repellent, how do you know you didn't need it? How do you know you wasted your putting that repellent on? You have no way of knowing that. Unless you like leave or one of your members of the group decides, I'll volunteer to be the control and not put any on and then see what happens. Um, or I'm not going to spray my arms and we'll see what happens. You know, th that's, that's, that's a common human behavior. Farmers are no different. How do you know you wasted your money on an insecticide? You'd have to go leave some part of it without treatment. Well, who's going to do that when you've got some of these crops like cranberries and potatoes are worth thousands, a couple thousand bucks more an acre? You don't want to risk it. Um, 
and it's these a lot of these exercises are very cheap. Um, and so I was like, well, let's just spray it on. I always call that the moron principle. Just put some put some more on. It's just that's what we all do. That's a common human behavior. How do you? I mean, the, how much? You know, you're supposed to all. I'm sure some of you have gardens and stuff, and you have plants for you know ornamentals. You're supposed to measure how much of this stuff to put on. Well, how many glugs is that? You know, well, that's that's there. That's enough. You know, you don't measure how much. How many of you actually measure how much when you make that compound? Uh, just a couple glugs. Okay, that's strong enough. Let's go. Um, oh, it didn't seem to kill it. Well, I'll put a few more glugs in next time. Um, and farmers are much more precise about it because they're losing money. They, don't, they do measure it because it's glugs. Or not, you can save yourself a few dollars an acre. It's worth it. But um, overall, I think it leads to less insecticide use, less pesticide use. That's my opinion. And I got some data to support it, but other people argue the other way and have some data to support it too. So. Yeah, that's a tough one. Um, we've all, I'm guessing a lot of you have had kids and you hate to go in and see your kid get sick and so you, you, you tend to doctor up and ask for the antibiotics. And um, I think early on in the world of antibiotics, we thought they would do everything and they ha they've done a lot. Um, and um, I, I, we're, I guess, some of you are older than me, I'm 51. And I've talked to people, a friend of mine, he said he had a great aunt who got a zit in her forehead, got infected and she died because they didn't have antibiotics yet. Um, this was back in you know, the early years. Um, the, the guy who won the Nobel Prize for, um, uh, oh, what's his name now? I can't think of it. The, the Peace Prize for um, the Green Revolution. I can't think of his name. Um, he, he, the, st the wheat doesn't tip over. Um, God. What's that guy's name? He's famous. I can't think of it. Um, uh, what? I, I know. I'm getting used to it. I'm getting used to it. Wait till I have my beer, and then it'll really be bad. Um, Norman Borlaug, I knew it would come to me. Norman Borlaug won the Nobel Peace Prize for the Green Revolution. He's credited with saving a billion people's lives. He said he was an undergraduate at the University of Minnesota. Um, he almost died um, in 1919 or something like that because he, didn't have, he had, just had a cold and it got worse and worse and he got a bad infection. Antibiotics saved him. He said, antibiotics saved my life. Um, and then we discovered they'd help animals do better as well. And so then it comes down to dollars and cents and you think, well, I think what's going to happen though is we're going to have to get more... Um, more um, focused on our uses of antibiotics because they're not a dime a dozen anymore. They seem to be, um, it's hard to find new ones. It's really what it boils down to. And so I think we're going to have to make some choices about that. And I have a feeling ag will lose out on giving antibiotics to cattle and to hogs as feed supplements. Um, they'll still probably do it as a uh, treatment for illnesses. But um, that's, my, that's my thought, that we'll have to get more responsible use of, of, of antibiotics because we haven't found good quick replacements for them. Uh, there's so many resistance out there now, different tuberculosis, staph infections, and stuff like that. Any other ones? Yeah, so um, if you do the genetic DNA modification, do you expect that you're going to eliminate that insect, uh, the tick yeah. or the They mosquito? can, they can, they think and they can. And then what is that gonna do to, you is know, that the it, it didn't make any difference to lose the dinosaur, but yeah, you lose well, all the mosquitoes. Uh, that's. I don't think actually they said they said they think they could eliminate mosquitoes and it wouldn't matter ecologically, but there's a lot of other things that I think they would. And that's a big meth, um, moral yeah, that's issue. some dumb people that would still survive then because a the mosquito didn't bite them, right? Yeah. <laughs> no, they are talking seriously about that. This conference I went to last March in North Carolina was that they had a bunch of um, philosophers, ethicists talking about these issues, um, and there are some technical issues. They're not sure they can actually do it. Theoretically, they can, but let's get it out there and really get a sense of that. Um, and that's what I'm talking about. That's one of the uncertainties. Then just because you can do something doesn't mean you should do it. You know, these are, these are real issues. And we talk about preventing extinctions. Then we're going to go out and try to drive a species to extinction. It just seems like... So it's, it's, uh, that's still up in the air whether we can do it, and I don't know if we should. Um, I, I personally wouldn't mind if we lost mosquitoes, but... Um, there are a lot of other things I worry about, and they worry about it. Will it jump to other species? Because, you know, some of these species interbreed sometimes, and then there's things, bacteria move genes between different species, and all these other weird things happen. And so uh, that's one of these big uncertainties um, about that, and that's a real a problem. We don't know the answers yet. So responsible use, I would say, let's figure some of this out before we start.
playing with these things broad scale. We probably have some of the worst um, examples in the area. Well, only uh, the of the large uh, farms with concentrations. Kiwani County is, yeah. you know, the one that comes to mind. Yep. I'm sure yep. for everyone, which everybody or most people know, it has a different ecological, you know, environment or whatever with the the limestone. Um, there's one a, a pig farm proposed for Bayfield area, and so I think you know you it, it, we all shudder, or yep. many of us shudder at the prospect of that. Are there some scientific advances coming in terms of handling the um, waste and the you know the the runoff, the problems that that result from that? No, that's a great question. I grew up on a hog farm. We did have hogs, and hearing about that person, they had that weird disease hitting the hogs, and they said, oh, I'll just move to Lake, Mich or Lake Superior in Ashland County or wherever, Bayfield. I'm like going, whoa, wait, that sounds like a bad idea. Um, one of the reasons Lake Superior is so clean is there's not a lot of people and there's not much agriculture around it. You know, that's, a, that's why it's the way it is. Um, I don't think there's, right now we haven't solved those problems. That's why I was talking about agriculture being a leaky system. Um, corn is actually one of the crops that is the least leaky in terms of like nitrogen. It's, it's, we do a much better job of putting fertilizer on it the right way, and corn is adapted, and it does a really good job of capturing it. But it still loses 30%, 40% easily, um, and that's a good one. You go with things like you pick your other crops, your broccolis and your apples and stuff like that. They don't, cap, they don't capture that stuff. They call it nutrient use efficiencies. They're not there. Um, and, so, and a lot of those crops use about as much fertilizer as corn. One reason broccoli looks so good, one reason apples look so nice is they fertilize them. Um, and, you know, they, I, I've done the math. They usually talk about in square footage, you have to convert it up to an acre a level, and they're putting on 100 pounds an acre. Well, that's kind of what we put on corn, a little bit more maybe. Um, and so, and some other crops use more. And, frankly, we don't have a way to farm without it leaking some. Um, and that's, that's why I think you get back to zoning. Where are we going to get the food we eat? We've got to put it somewhere. We gotta, where are we going to dig it out of the ground? Where are we going to grow the stuff we want? And... I, maybe this stuff will come, but we ha it's one of those hard problems that's really hard to solve, and so um, we could spend billions of dollars and still not solve it. I mean, we've been dropping millions of dollars trying to solve that citrus greening problem. We haven't really got anything, um, and we've been working on nitrogen and phosphorus for years, and we've improved, but we're still not there. Um, that's, that's what I'd say. So. That's why I think certain areas are much better for having those kind of agriculture than others. Um, Central Iowa, that beautiful black prairies, um, it's going to have corn and soybeans there for a long time. Um, whether you want it in other places, I'm not sure we do yet. Prices will matter, um, and that's what will drive that, and it's a world market. And so when the price of corn hits $12, $15 a bushel, we might see corn up here because it'll be like, oh, I can grow corn. It's just it's worth so much. Why shouldn't I? Um, that's what... But back to your original question, I, we haven't come up with anything yet to fix it. We've improved, but we haven't fixed it. That's what I'd say. We have a question online. Oh, I just lost it. Hang on. <laughs> um, yes, a question came um, online. Can you talk about growing crops in the Netherlands? Do you know? Yeah, they, um, they, there are, there's a couple things they do. One, they do, they're a big potato producer. We grow potatoes. Um, they're also a big hog producer, um, Netherlands is. Um, they're Europe's hog farm, if you will. Um, and they, you know, push the water away, and they got a lot of sand. That, those, that river's beds and the ocean floor are sandy. And so you can do a lot of stuff there. They have a lot of environment, re environmental regulations, but they still have, it's not perfect. It's still a leaky ecosystem. Um, and, you know, it, it still smells like pig poop there sometimes. I went to... <laughs> This one university is called Wagenagen or Wagenagen, or I can't ever say it right. It looks like Wagen Ingen. Um, it, it's, I don't know how to say it right. But um, it's sort of their version of Iowa State, a big ag university in the middle of, uh, thank you, in the middle of uh, outside of Amsterdam. And, and I remember we're doing our conference talking, and like, man, you can smell the hog manure. Um, and it was this because they are Europe's um, hog farm, basically. Um, and so they've been doing a lot of genetic stuff there. They also do a lot of tulips. Um, they do a lot of root crops because that's what these sands are good for. You can do these root crops. That's why um, around here, the central sands, we could grow a lot of nice root crops around here. If you add water and some nutrients, you'll get a lot of um, great 
root vegetables, beets and carrots and um, potatoes. Do you want them? And then, the, and then the prices sort of tell us as a society, yes, this is worth doing or no, that's not worth doing. We don't have a command and control where the dictator tells you everybody what to do. Um, we use prices. So that's what I know. Unless they have something more specific, that's about all I know about Netherlands. Um, they do a lot of dairy as well. A question right here in front. Will some of the trends you mentioned, such as genetic modification or uh, big data, affect the timber industry up here? Big data, the, they, we, they fly over things all the time and take pictures. We get down, and that's hitting the conservation world and the... Um, We'll call it, I don't know what to call it, uh, forestry would be part of it. I mean, forestry is kind of, kind of farming the forest, I guess, is a way to think of it. Um, that there's other uses you put while it's growing trees. You can think of it that way. And they just have a new master's program in UW. It's something like earth observation and something. I can't remember what it's basically applying informatics things to forestry and other fields. But, and, you know, it, so yes, it will. Um, and we'll know more about what's where and where things are moving to and the health of things by learning. They use a lot of that multispectral imaging. Um, it's not just satellites. You go to drones. Farm machinery has on the equipment as well. You put it on the pivots. So it's all the way up from space, all the way down just a couple feet above the, the crop or, in this case, a few feet above the forest. We can put sensors out there all over the place now. And so it's back to that same problem is we have a ton of data. What do we do with it? And then you're back to this question of what are my goals, then how do I use this information to achieve those goals? And so, yes, it will impact it, um, but and we still are working out the methods. Everybody is. Um, so, I, I, do you have something more specific? Or? No, but that's the big data. I, genetics is harder in the sense that trees take so long to live. It's just, I, I felt so hard. My first job out of grad school was at Texas A&M. And I, I met the pecan breeder. I'm like, wow, what a crappy job. You work for years just to get a new, you cross all these trees and stuff. You got a new tree, but you, you think you got it. You have a whole bunch of them. You got to wait like five years or something just to get a few pecans to see if they're any good. And then even more to see how well the tree lives. That's, trees are so slow. Um, it's just like insects are great because they just roll over real quickly. You get new generations. <laughs> um, trees, you just got to be patient. Um, you know, no, what's that? Nobody plants an acorn for themselves. They plant it for the next generation because you're never going to enjoy the oak tree you plant. It's just going to be, take a long time to get big. So that's, that's my opinion there. Uh, Vilas and Oneida County have big state forests and national forests. And that's very compatible with this being a vacation or retirement area. So many of us live either on lakes or in the trees, in the forests. Yep. Now, this trade-off on converting some of those lands into growing crops, will that inevitably happen because the land is more valuable to grow other kinds of crops? Is that a trend that will happen, or will that? Yes and no, in the sense of, to me, it, let's say you just love these woods the way they are, and you don't want things to change right. up here. Then, <laughs> that, then you, want, you want China to get better at growing corn. You want Brazil to get better at growing corn. You've got to put it somewhere, let them have it. And they're so behind. If we can get those developing nations to do a better job, it puts less pressure on our land. And then just getting our farmers to do to get more yield. You see, there's a yield trend. Every year, cows get more productive. Every year, corn gets more productive. It, part of it's management, part of it's genetics. There's a lot of new technologies and stuff. That means that keeps the price low. Um, that's, and that means you don't need to put, plow up the northern prairies of, of Canada to put in corn and soybeans because you don't need to. There's no, no money to be made. Um, that's I always come back to what does it do to the price. And so it, that's really... Is recreation demand, forestry demand, so valuable that it can outcompete the um, corn and soybeans dairy farms? If yes, then you can see trees. If no, then it's going to be hard to justify keeping it in there. And that's kind of what happened. You know, they first mowed down the north woods and put up, cut all the trees down and tried to do dairy farming because it didn't work. Because the prices are right. God, those cheese are so cheap. Just cut them down. And, oh, yeah, sell to these people and we'll let them put dairies there. It just didn't work. Um, you want – that's what I always tell people. We – don't we, how do we tell people what to do? We can make rules and stuff, but everybody breaks rules. We all speed a little bit. We all don't quite make a complete stop. If you make a rule about some land use, someone's going to cheat on it somewhere or find a way around that rule. Prices are um, the way we talk to each other, tell each other how valuable different activities, different things are. 
Um, that's what economists talk about markets for. Markets can fail, and they do all the time, but um, they do have some value. And that's what it comes back to. Um, how much are people willing to pay to keep the woods the way they are, as opposed to let corn and soybeans and dairy farms and hay and apples or blueberries or whatever come in? It's going to come down to economics, I think, and some of that. That's, that's what we argue, anyway. Economics tells us how to allocate the land. Um, so that, that's my thoughts. I don't know if you have a response or for the question. Or. question. I've always heard that the growing season is defined by the time from between the last frost in the spring and the first frost in the fall, and that that period is pretty short up here and limits economical agriculture. To what yeah. extent is that true? And is that changing? Is that yeah. increasing that period because of climate change? Yeah, it, basically the last frost is coming a little earlier. It's basically, the growing season is getting a little longer. A little bit longer in the spring, you get a little bit, you get in a little earlier in the spring and get out a little later in the fall. And then plant breeding has just gotten so much better um, that we, because you, you, the, the light regime changes and that affects plant, a whole bunch of plant things change um, because of the, how long the day is and that triggers things. And so they can breed that. It just takes a little time to get the, the crop ready for the different light regime. Um, and frankly, what you do is you just plant them closer together is another thing. The gr short growing season, the key, the key then is to get, get it in as soon as possible. So cold tolerance, genetically engineered, will be great. Um, they do some seed treatments on the soil in case it's a little cool. It kills off any of the, the bacteria or pathogens that will make your seed rot while it's waiting till it warms up. And then um, planting it close together so as fast as possible you get canopy closure and capture all the sunlight. That's what we do up north. You go further south and they plant the plants further apart because you don't, you're not in such a big rush because seed's expensive. Um, so we can deal with that. Um, and this season you can see the data has gotten a little longer. Um, and so that means we can get certain crops through faster. Um, you know, they can make it work. But the corn is all, they call it 90-day corn, 100-day corn, 105-day corn. It's how many days it takes to be for maturity. And as you go north, you just plant shorter-day corn. Um, and they breed that. And that's when they go to Canada, Manitoba, they've got corn. They can grow that light regime. So if they can grow it up there, we can grow it down here. Um, it comes down to the heat and the, the other stuff. The, the light is part of it. So we could if we wanted to. That's, that's what I'm saying. A question back here. Uh, going back to corn, I'm wondering if you know how much of the expansion in corn was due to the move towards corn ethanol and fuel supplementation. And if that's the case, how do we prepare communities in the state of Wisconsin if those subsidies are pulled back and the price of corn drops and it's no longer economically viable in some of the marginal areas that it's presently being done in? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I get that one a lot. First off, I think it's a large chunk. I think it's, I forget the number. It's, uh, I, I, I should have looked before I came up and I forgot to. Um, the, most, the biggest use is still livestock, um, not fuel, um, because when they take the fuel, they make like 1.8 gallons per bushel or something, oh no, it's 2.6 gallons per bushel of corn. Then there's a whole bunch of leftover distiller grains they feed the cows anyway, or to animals. Um, it's surprisingly, the economists sit around and argue about how the, the ethanol mandate has affected prices. They can't find a strong signal, which I find surprisingly weird. Um, I don't work in that area, so I, I distrust them. Um, they argue about it all the time. Um, that it's hard to really demonstrate that. Part of what they've, I've heard people argue is that the ethanol is a cheap way to add octane to gasoline, and that changes its price that you can sell it for or something. And so even if we got rid of the ethanol mandate, they'd still want ethanol because it's a way to add octane or something, mm -hmm. but there's a limit to it. I don't, I don't quite understand about that exactly. We call it the, the blend wall. And that they sort of say even if we got rid of some of these mandates, we'd still have ethanol um, in, in gasoline. How would you prepare for it is we're going through it right now. Um, I don't know if you guys follow, but crop farmers have been losing money pretty solidly the last three years in a row. The farm income's been falling because the price, the cost is up here per bushel in the Mart, the price they're getting is right here. They've been under tremendous pressure to cut their costs and maintain yields. Um, but farmers go through this all the time. And so what would happen if we did lose the ethanol mandate? I think we would see a price drop. We'd have to. I don't know how economists can, can't figure that one out, but it's not my field. I do a different thing. Um, how would you prepare for it is farmers are always prepared for it. They always, uh, the weather's never right for a farmer. It's, if it's, if, you know, 
The only cure for low prices are more low prices because then all the neighbors quit. Um, not me, I'm not quitting. The neighbors are going to quit. And then high prices are, what cures high prices is high prices. And everybody starts growing corn or soybeans or cattle or whatever. So they would shake, it'd be a shakedown and people would change. That's, that's what happened. Would it be bad for a while? Yeah, it would, low prices hurt. Um, to the, but they're used to it. Um, they know prices. You know, they, if the price is good today, they, well, um, it'll be bad t- next year. Um, it, they, they're, the, they're the perennial optimist and perennial pessimist at the same time. I don't know how they do it. But. Question here? Uh, two questions. What do we do about the not in my backyard theory? <laughs> <clears throat> okay. And the second question would be, if we get rid of all the mosquitoes, what else do we lose out there? Yeah, that's a good question. For, th- not in my backyard, NIMBY. That's everyone, we all kind of sat down, yeah, I think he's got it right there. We dig it or grow it. Um, that's, but not in my backyard, damn it. Um, that's human nature. And how are you going to solve human nature? We're not. Um, and that's institutions and history play a lot. Culture plays a lot. That's why Iowa has got all that corn and soybeans because that land is really good. But I've been down there, and I, I don't want to live in central Iowa. Um, it's much nicer in Wisconsin. Um, just a lot of big corn and soybean fields everywhere with little fence rows once in a while. Um, and then they dam up a little stream and call it a lake and make it a state park. Um, that's, that's their vision. Um, no offense if you're from Iowa. That's what I saw when I was there. I'm from Iowa. Um, so that is, there's a, there's a couple things I see. There's a lot of human problems, health and e- ecological, environmental, just social problems are really kind of tie back to that not in my backyard. Um, Pick your favorite one. Um, there's, uh, but that not, I don't. I understand we need that, but not. I don't want it next to me. Um, the other one would be sort of. There's a lot of things where you get the benefit now, but pay the cost later. I can enjoy this beer, um, but you know, if you do too much of it, wow, I've gained a lot of weight. Um, you know, but I don't pay. That's all. Oh, that's off in the future. I don't care. Um, the same thing now is there's a lot. So that's a lot of problems there. We overdo things because we don't pay the cost till later. Same thing is there's a lot of things we do where um, we are supposed to pay the cost now and enjoy the benefit later. Those are really tough sells. And the other one is a tough sell is I understand we need to do something with these immigrants. We need to do something with these cows. Got to put them somewhere. Just don't put them by me, please. Or pick your favorite, immigrants, the people from some other ethnic group, people from a different religion, cows, a bunch of stinky pigs. We don't want those things by us, but we understand, yeah, we need cows. Yeah, immigrants, yeah, people, other people are fine. Um, just don't put them in my school. Don't put them in my backyard. Um, that, we're all a little bit xenophobic, I think, of strangeness. We're all like, you know, I don't want cows in my backyard. I don't want pigs next door. I don't want a big windmill next to me. I understand we need renewable energy. I just don't want the windmill in my backyard. Um, I, there's no answer to those. Th- those are, that's what politics is all about, and that's kind of why I think politics is so ugly, because Sometimes there's never a winner. Somebody just has to make a decision that there's no obvious answer. It's going to go in somebody's backyard, damn it. And it's going to be usually someone who doesn't have political power. Um, so that's my thoughts. We'll never solve that problem. It's going to be around forever. And I forget the other one already. Mosquitoes. mosquitoes. I heard ecologists tell me we could lose mosquitoes and be okay. I still find it hard to believe because they've been around for so long, and you'd think so many species would be adapted to their presence. So I'd like to ask more ecologists that question more formally in a broad perspective to see if we could really get rid of all mosquitoes. Because A, it would make, it'd be nice, but B, my guess is something else would fill its place anyway. We'd get gnats or something else. I don't know. Um, the, lime, the ticks would get worse. So I find it hard to believe we, couldn't get, we could get rid of mosquitoes and not have some ecological effect. Um, but I've supposedly heard that they won't. But... I was just wondering, what are your thoughts about crop rotation and some of the no-till farming? Yeah, no-till really came on um, as a way, to save, it's basically it saves energy. And so um, it works in some places, in other places it doesn't work. It has to do a lot of times with how heavy the soil is and stuff. And, and we kind of maxed, we've kind of flattened out. We haven't really had a big change in no-till. It's about a third of the acres, I remember. And we've been losing some of it because of um, herbicide-resistant weeds. Um, basically, you go back to a lot of stuff you can do about using rotations and things like that, a lot of cultural controls. But in the end, you know, sure, you killed 80% of the weeds and using some of these cultural methods. There's still 20% running around. Um, that could totally knock out your yield. 
So what are you luck? You're stuck with two hammers, tillage or herbicides. That's pretty much everything else can help, but it doesn't solve the problem. It only helps. So no-till means you've got to use more herbicides. Um, and then these herbicide-resistant weeds, we've moved back. Um, some people said, I can't get it to work. I've got these problems. I've got to go, I got to till to get rid of some of these weeds. Um, there's some other problems that pop up. The soils are colder. They get um, slugs have really adapted to them now. I guess they're really bad in some areas. Um, they, they, eat the, they eat the young crop. Um, and so they adapted to the no-till situation. But it definitely works for some farmers in some situations really well. And there's a lot of farmers have figured that out and are using it. Um, what was the other part of it? Um, crop rotation. Yeah, and that's back to rotation. Economics drives a lot of that. Um, a lot of, um, I remember talking to early, when I first got here in 04, meeting some of the potato farmers, they talked about, yeah, we grow sweet corn, yeah, we grow green beans, but really we make our money on the potato year in the rotation. The other two years are just holes in the rotation because we can't plant potato after potato because you get all this disease pressure and stuff. And so they're just, it's just an just a empty spot in the rotation to break up disease cycles. Um, then corn prices got high. Well, shoot, I won't grow sweet corn. I'll grow field corn um, and make, more, make money. Um, so crop rotation, it has benefits, and it, it will rotate. A lot of st stuff will naturally rotate. You don't do a lot of soybeans on soybeans because of diseases. We can do corn on corn. Um, and to be honest, a lot of these biotechnologies, rootworm-resistant corn, the corn borer-resistant corn, allows you to do more corn on corn. Um, there's still about 25% of the corn is planted following corn. There's still a lot of areas of corn after corn after corn. Um, there's parts, I remember parts in Italy that are living like 30 years of corn on corn. Um, and so it's not just here, it's everywhere. There's places that do that. And that's about the only crop we seem to be able to do that with um, because it seems to be resistant to stuff. And I, but a lot of, even that, um, Joe Lauer is the corn agronomist at UW and he can show just the yield gains you get from rotating, excuse me, rotating back and forth. If you do a couple, three years of corn and then go back to soybeans and back, there's still that yield bump from that one year of soybean. You can see it in the data, um, and it just slowly dissipates as you do more corn on corn. So corn on corn works for some people, but crop rotation is generally the way we go. And the problem is, is it's hard to find four or five crops you can make money on really well. A couple, yes, corn and soybeans work. Corn, soybeans, and wheat, often the benefit is to break up the cycle of some pest or to relieve a, a labor pressure because um, wheat kind of has a lot of activity in years, parts of the year when corn and soybeans aren't so busy. And so it's more about spreading out your workload um, than it is about making more money on the wheat. Um, so I don't know if that helps or if that's what your question is. Or, um, but a lot of times farmers think a lot about crop rotation. They don't just make this up. They're, there's a reason they do it. And... They're trying to balance workload and money as with, along with other things. A question right here. I recently uh, listened to a program on public television regarding uh, the use of uh, herbicides like Roundup in mm -hmm. the growing of crops and the harvesting of crops. And this was, this was a, a university professor, uh, a doctorate in her study, and she was correlating the beginning use of Roundup uh, and the increased use of Roundup with the increase in uh, neurological and cognitive disorders in children. Do you know of that, and can you speak to that? Um, I don't know that study specifically, but yeah, there's epidemiology is kind of what I think that falls into is a lot like economics. You can find correlations. It's always hard. Correlation and causation are two different things. Economists worry about prices, and they can show correlations between things that don't make sense. And then you got. Then we always ask ourselves, just show me the proof. Give me some causation. And that's that would be the thing. Just because there's correlation doesn't mean causation. Um, but it, it's probably it's still obvious these herbicides do have effects on things. You know they're meant to kill weeds, um, so they probably affect other things as well. Um, it's it's just that here. And this is thing. I, I still think we. Rachel Carson did a lot in the sense that she really pointed out these problems with the, of pesticides in general. And we focus heavily on pesticides, and there's, there's reasons for that. I mean, they do, they have, we've done some stupid things. With it. It's really obvious. And there's a lot of other risks we just seem to ignore um, that are just as bad or worse. Um, we all don't have any problem jumping in our cars and driving around. Um, 30,000 people die a year in automobiles. Um, you know, I don't think we kill 30,000 people a year from pesticides. Um, 
and that's, we've really dropped the number of people dying in auto accidents. It used to be much higher. Other risks in, on our food, there's tons of them. Um, the, the little molds and stuff like that, that we, the, the, the little black spots on fruits and vets, potato black spots are actually toxic. Um, you know, we, the sunshine, we do put on sunscreen, but we don't st all stay inside and hide because there's a risk of that. So it's, and there's a lot of these things that have risks and it, balancing those risks against the benefits is what the EPA is supposed to do. And I always think the EPA is kind of stuck in a hard place because everybody seems to hate them, which I guess that means they're doing the right thing at that point because that's kind of their job. Um, I think the way to describe the EPA is their job is to not get sued um, because if they're too stringent, they get sued. If they're too lax, they get sued. They have to be right in that sweet spot where they haven't done enough screw-ups so that they can get sued. Um, and so that's where you kind of get back to this, this one study. Maybe it's a bigger meta-analysis about the impacts of pesticides, and we worry a lot about pesticides more than we worry about other equal risks, I think. Um, show me, can you really make a strong case that you could use it as evidence to the EPA to make a regulatory decision on? Then the EPA can make an action with it because then they can't be sued. That's, that's, that's the, really what it boils down to. Um, if it is really a problem and you can demonstrate it enough that they can make a regulatory decision, then we could make a change. Um, that's, that's my feeling right there. Otherwise, there's a lot of stuff we talk about at the universities that it isn't necessarily, it might be true, but it might not be relevant um, and, or actionable. Just because something's true and maybe even relevant, can you act on it? Um, and that's, it's kind of back to the same thing. You know, people misbehave, but then it comes down to, can you prove it in court? Sometimes you know they've done something wrong, but you can't prove it in court, too. Um, that's kind of what the, that's pesticide regulation, and, and, and to me, in a nutshell. Yes, they have effects. Other things have effects that are probably just as bad or worse. We don't worry about those. We worry about pesticides. Um, but in the end, we can worry about a lot of things, but we have to make rules about how we're going to worry about them as a society. We call that the EPA, making pesticide regulations. But there's other things we don't regulate um, that are probably just as bad or worse. Um, you know, the food, um, there's a lot of um, the, pa the pathogens, the molds and fungi in food, it can actually be pretty bad, but we don't worry about those so much, um, is what I've been told by food scientists. But again, maybe they're full of crap too, I don't know, or it's just one study, <laughs> you know? I mean, you guys seen the health stuff, oh, you're supposed to do this, no, six years later, no, you're not supposed to, you're supposed to do that. And we tend to be herd animals that chase the, the thing, um, whatever the thing is, you know, the newest fad. Um, and that's the EPA and pesticide stuff in general. It seems to always, we're always looking for a problem with pesticides. And that's, I think, due to Rachel Carson's impact. And sometimes I think we could find other things that probably have more benefit, worse risks. Not saying pesticides don't have risks, it's that there might be other risks that we're missing because we're so focused on one thing. Um, and that's, I would say, due to her personality, her finding the right thing to point out that problem at the right moment, and, and a huge impact. Um, but sometimes I think we miss the, there's other trees in the forest we could be chasing. And we are herd animals. We do chase things. I mean, we really do. Question here. You commented quite a bit about corn and soybeans, and you also mentioned some of the very large dairies. Do you, do you see a shortage of forage crops like hay for these big dairies, or does price eventually fix that? Yeah, uh, price will get to everything eventually. We are, that's, that's me as an economist talking. Um, no, we don't have too much trouble making forage here. Um, forage can grow on lands we don't even need to, you can't even farm, but you can grow forage on it a lot of times. I grew up in northeastern, northeastern Iowa, it's very hilly. We had a lot of, we did corn and hay all the time. And some of that, I was, I've been on a hay wagon that's been tipping over and I go, oh, I gotta get off this and jump off as the wagon's tipping over. That's probably too steep to be farming. Um, yet we were. Um, and my point is you can grow forage on places that you can't do a lot of other stuff. I don't see a big, forage shortage around here. Um, that, that's probably why we might end up, if we do go to mega dairies everywhere, we don't choose a policies to prevent that if we don't want that. Um, we will probably come out ahead because we can grow forage here. We have a really good climate. That's why Ireland is green. They have a lot of dairies there because it grows stuff and then you feed it to the cows. Um, yeah, as long as we have water, unless climate change really goofs up something, you know, in the water or the temperatures or something, um, I, I think we'll have a lot of forage here. We have, we have a question online. Yeah, a question came in online. Uh, what's the potential for industrial hemp mm. in Northwoods agriculture? Yeah, the, 
Yeah, that's a good one, actually. Um, uh, we'll give you, first I'll give you a story. I have a, one of my more successful gra undergraduate students went to California and became a, a medical marijuana grower, and he's done quite well. Um, and, but it's all indoors, that stuff is, and that's not your industrial hemp. That's medical marijuana. And, um, but he's getting out because he literally, he said safety is always, or uh, what's the word? Um, criminal activity is always a problem. People are trying to rob you all the time. And um, that, that industry, we don't, people don't talk about it, but that, he said they basically he's getting out at the end of the year because they had someone took over with guns and tried to, was ready to shoot people and stuff like that and tried to get the money. Um, so um, industrial hemp, though, is what, that's what it originally was used for. I mean, you go back to the ancient world, that's what they were using. It was used for um, paper and clothing, and they figured out you could get high off it too. Um, you go back to one of the first historians, Herodotus, he talked about the Scythians, which we think are kind of like horsey people on the other side of the Caspian Sea, um, would throw it on fires and breathe it and get high. Um, and it, it, so it's like, that's where our first historian was noting that. Um, industrial hemp is the I mean, I remember as a kid, those big ass weeds you'd see were huge, and you, you couldn't cut them down. They were, and so it can be done. Um, the reality, in my opinion, is, is um, we can over, never underestimate the potential of agriculture to oversupply any market. We can always grow more than we need, and then the price falls. And then it moves to the areas that can actually do it cheaply. Um, we could do it in the U.S. somewhere. I know Hungary is the major producer in Europe, and I, don't, I think they have a little drier summers than we have, a little hotter, drier than we do. So maybe further south would be better. Um, industrial hemp would make good rope. It'd make clothing and stuff. And so, but we've kind of done the fiber thing. We do a good job with trees and softwood poplars and other things. So I don't know if we, maybe hemp would grow well here. I don't know enough. But um, we kind of, this part of the country, I think would be better in trees than hemp, um, you know, as a way to get fiber. I don't think we make clothing out of trees yet, do we? I don't know. Um, <laughs> might be kind of chafing. I don't know. Um, <laughs> I'm sure they can soften it somewhere, genetically engineer the tree to make a, a softer fiber. Um, but no, I think we could. But, you know, the, the laws are that way. We're not going to do that until we decide about what we're going to do about marijuana. Um, once we do that, then we can start doing research on things, medical stuff, as well as industrial production. But for, I'm sure some of you have seen those old movies. We've been sort of an anti-marijuana country for since the whatever years, you know, long before I've been born. Um, and I don't see that changing until that changes. Then we can find out about, make, can we do that stuff? I have a question. Um, back to your CAFOs and your comment that they are coming. It's going to happen. Um, and we see the issues like the one gal talked about, Kiwana County yep. and wells getting contaminated and things like this. And anybody who knows me knows that this is an impossible choice for me, but it seems that clean drinking water would be more important than butter. Even though yeah. I really love both. But we need butter. And so but the, we don't need it as much as water to drink. Well, depends where you are. We, and we that's, need money if yep. you want to, or butter if you want to make money off of it. And this so is where the, do we put the it, monetary value on water? It's really about where do you put the butter production, where do you put the water. That's what you really, that's this back to is not in my backyard. We are in the end. Well, yeah. Here. I know. And so that's, you can make a strong case for saying, yeah, that, really what I would like you to see, try to get out of this is, it could happen here. Then the question is, well, we, I'm guessing you don't want it to happen here. So then what are you going to do about that? That's something to think about. If the economic pressures, because the way I think of economics pressures, and this is market forces are like big rivers pushing. Politicians can only fight those economic forces some. They might think they can do a lot, um, but um, they can't. I mean, I'm sorry. There's, you know, there are big rivers of, of energy, and you can't stop them. And... So politics can only do so much. And so I think you guys can make a strong case and probably biologically slash physically that it's probably not the smartest place to put some of that stuff here. Um, and then the fact of the matter is, is you want to have um, the other uses just as make them as valuable as you can because then it becomes, well, why do I want to tear my lodge down and plow up this, cut these trees down and put a farm in because I make more money doing the lodge and letting people hike through my woods in the wintertime or whatever, you know. You have to, that's how you fight the market forces with market forces. Um, and you can't, you can rely some on politic, political solutions, but I think in the end, those economic forces went out. You got to put those animals somewhere. You got to get butter somewhere. You got to dig up the ground somewhere to make metal so you can have a car you got to grow the trees somewhere so we can have houses. You know, you got to put that I'm stuff not somewhere. Those we actually need. 
water. So you're willing to go live in the wild and just not have any metal, not have any wood? You know, go back to, no, we, in the end, that's what, and this is, I, I have this argument with my wife. You're actually taking my wife's argument. Um, we have a lot of debates in our house, and not always um, as courteous as this one. Um, <laughs> um, it, one person's need is another person's want, or something they could do without. And, and that's, that's why markets talk to each other. You're like, I don't need that. I don't want that. So you're not willing to buy whatever it is, the butter, the car. I'm happy with the old used vehicle. I'm happy riding my bike or something. Um, other people, oh, my God, I need a car. It, was, it rained a little bit today. I mean, I've been down south where it gets to 50 degrees. Oh, get the parkas out. Get the gloves and stocking hats out. It's gonna, we're going to die. Um, and if we do the same thing. It gets to 85. Oh, my God, it's so hot. You know, um, and they're laughing because that's a spring morning. Um, it, it, that, what one person... That, Needs and wants, and that's how you kind of average out over everybody's needs and wants is through markets and prices when they work right. But so we do need a lot of things. Um, it, it's, but each person needs different amounts. That's really what it comes down to. Um, and question. Yeah, I don't know what else to say about that other than you've got to have to make non, um, non-agricultural uses valuable enough to compete with the agricultural forces. I don't know how, but that's, that would be my suggestion. So do you think the, um, the large mega dairy farms are going to drive all the smaller ones out of business other than a few niche ones? Um, it doesn't drive them out of business. is that they decide to quit because they can't live with those prices. That's what it is. Um, in the sense of they, the big farms can produce milk at a lower price. And so I'll make up a number here. Milk sells, make up a number, $18 a hundredweight. Well, if it costs you $20 a hundredweight, after a while you can say, you know, I can't, I'm not going to sell milk anymore at 18. I'm going to quit. Um, whereas the other guy can raise it for $17 a hundredweight. He says, yeah, I'll keep doing it. The smaller guy is going to finally get frustrated with, and they don't lose money. When these numbers we quote are often what we call, include opportunity costs, it, I always think of it, it's working really hard up there every morning, getting your cow's milk, doing all this work, 60 hours a week, doing always married to the cows to make $30,000 a year. Well, shoot, I could work 40 hours a week in town and make 45. You know, I'm done doing cows. I'm going to go take the job in town. Um, that's, what they, that's how it happens. They don't drive them out as much as they're willing to survive at those lower prices. Um, that's, they can, and they can operate at those prices and earn normal rates of return where the smaller operators finally get tired of earning below average rates of return. Um, they could make more money doing other things. And so they kind of start to feel like, I'm sick of working this hard and making that little bit of money. I'm going to go do something else. That's, that's, that's what I mean by strong economic forces. And I always tell the students, markets are brutal. They, they, that's how they work. And if you can't survive at that price, you're going to face the brutal choices. You're going to earn below average returns or you're going to go do something else. Um, that's what markets do to people. Um, See that one. When you genetically modify plants, do you start to lose the benefit of the nutrition from that plant? Do, do food scientists look at genetically modified corn compared to old seed corn? Yeah. Um that's a good question, and people have been looking at that stuff. Um, that's some of this heirloom varieties of tomatoes and stuff. They do taste different, and it's and it's I went. It's not so much I wouldn't argue for genetic modification as industrialization of it or commercialization, where we kind of like all the tomatoes to be the same because then they go through the conveyor belt and get packaged up and look the same in the grocery store. That's what, and so we lose something there, and then we go back and find all these cool heirloom tomatoes, and they have some neat flavors and stuff, but now all of a sudden we gotta have a different SKU number for it at the grocery store when you run it through the scanner, and uh, it packages different. This one gets four, this one can get five. Well, how do you price it when there's five in there? Because we're always, all the systems set up for four. That's why we get these commercialized, unitized things. Um, because it makes the system work better when you're trying to sell tomatoes to all the grocery stores in the U.S. You know, or something like that. Um, so, and they do lose something. It's tough. But um, 
so I, went, I, went, I don't think it's genetic modification as much as that right there, trying to get something that you can ship all over the place. You know, everybody wants to go and pick your favorite restaurant chain, Applebee's. When you go in the Applebee's in Boston versus the one in San Diego, they're supposed to kind of be the same. And so, well, that means somebody somewhere had to grow the same tomato to put in the salad, had to grow the same kind of lettuce to put in the salad, had to grow the same, make the same kind of cheese to make the cheese sauce or whatever. Um, and that's, that's what drives it. There was a, I should find this citation again, but somebody went through and looked at old paintings. Um, you know, the still lifes? where they used to sit down and put the, the, the flowers and the cut the vegetables and lay it out and the, the bird would be there and they'd paint it. And they'd do the still lifes. And they, what was really nice is they sat through and looked at the ones from the 1600s of different fruits and vegetables we see today and compared them to each other. And it's like, we have done a lot in breeding. You know, carrots used to be these little scrawny things. The watermelons were real bland looking, whitish more than pink, and they had real big, huge seeds in them. Um, we have genetically modified that stuff through the last couple hundred years improving the flavor. Did we lose some? Yeah, there's a whole, you go look at those heirloom tomatoes. They're all these weird flavors that are cool that we just ignored um, because we picked the red one. Um, I think the apple industry, think back to the, 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 um, the, the gold or the red delicious apple kind of took over for a while and now we've gone back and got all these new varieties and, and the potato is trying to do the same thing. We're not there with all these different carrot varieties or um, tomato, heirloom tomatoes are kind of coming that way. And so that's what I'd say. I, I don't think there's a nutritionally huge differences. Um, and it's more to breeding generally, not just GM. That's genetic modification. That's, that would be my argument. Um, we've done a lot to these things, and it's not just genetic modification. One more question back here. Yeah, there have been several questions uh, recently that, are, that seem to be touching on the same thing. And I'm just wondering, it seems like there's increased consumer interest in natural foods, organic foods, locally grown foods. Um, is that starting to impact um, agriculture? Most of what we've talked about tonight is more what I would consider big ag. Yes. Is that, um, is that starting to impact things? Are you seeing that as a niche market that's going to go away? Do you see it as something growing that could conceivably change the nature of agriculture in the future? Yeah, there's going to be some there's a lot of that niche marketing. I don't know what to call it. Local production. Um, that's, that's the rage everywhere. I've, I've been, I travel enough to work for jobs, and you see it everywhere you go. Um, everyone wants that. Um, it's just that in the end, um, the large volume of the food is still big ag um, that in terms of the volume. And then there's um, a lot of corn and soybeans because we have a lot of meat, cheese, um, eggs, and stuff like that. How do you make those things? You feed them corn and soybeans. Um, and sure, there might be locally grown eggs or locally grown, made cheese. Um, it, what I don't see, though, is economies of scale and just you know, not uh, uh, any comparative advantage. We're never going to be a world-renowned tomato production area unless we get really hot here. Um, it just we're not, and unless we maybe we find something else we can do really well. Um, but it's so you get good at certain things. It doesn't mean we can't grow tomatoes but we're not going to have the best tomatoes that you can ship around. Um, and so I, I always think of it this way. Local is not an excuse for crappy. Um, that's, that's, you still want good stuff. And so we're, I, I used to go to, I used to live in Texas. You go to the cheese section, there's, the, there's cheese, and then you go to the um, imported cheese. And that's where Wisconsin cheese was. It was in the imported <laughs> cheese section. Because it was imported meant it was high quality. And that's where they put the Wisconsin cheese. All the other cheese was that boring stuff. And that, and that's what I mean. Local doesn't mean crappy. It's still, and so we're not going to see local coffee. We might see local coffee roasting, but we're not going to see local coffee. Local citrus, we're not going to see that here. You know? But Florida, you go down there, oh, yeah, we got local citrus, you know. Uh, and so we have to find what we're good at up here, um, and we'll do that. And I think we'll see the lettuce production for the aquaculture. We can do that. Um, and there's other things we can do really well. Will we become a world shipper? Probably not. I, why would we? I mean, they don't need to. Um, they can grow their own lettuce. Um, that's what I feel like. But so that's my feeling. Local, yes, it's definitely there. I don't see it taking over the market and becoming the dominant way we do everything. Um, there's just too many advantages. They can grow things cheaper elsewhere, and that we, it's cheaper to ship it in, and it tastes better, frankly. Um, the better stuff. Okay, one more. Sorry. <laughs> This maybe goes a bit along with what she's talking about. What about a general um, direction of just eating less meat and how that affects? 
Yeah, that's a very good question. I, I tell that to people. Um, there's a lot of people that are bothered. You know, why do we grow so much corn and soybeans? Why is there just all this dead zones? Or all, they're actually all around the world um, because ag kind of leaks a little bit and it gets out in the lakes and rivers and makes dead zones. Um, well, then quit eating so much meat, dairy, and cheese, and eggs and stop driving so much. Um, that would solve a huge amount of problem. And just eating less. But those are hard things to do. I mean, some of these things are really good. Um, it's, I love cheese. I love, um, you know, the good kinds of meat. But that's the reality. And I think we're in sort of a post-industrial world where we're, we're ahead of the curve. You tell that to Africans, they're just going to die laughing. You know, it's like, eat less? I've been eating less, and my parents have eaten less for centuries, and I'm ready to eat more. Um, but obesity is a worldwide phenomenon. You know, Mexico's got obesity problems, and it's like, geez, they're, they're half developed in some sense, you know, more. And I think we're going to have to learn how to eat less, not because we want to or we're even saving the environment. We're just going to feel better. Um, but it is so unnatural. That I think it's going to be a very tough thing to do. And then a lot of people, if you want to, if you really, if your main concern is I'm really bothered by agriculture's impact on the environment, stop eating meat um, and all the things that we do, meat, cheese, eggs, and, and stuff. I don't know if I could argue being a vegan because I, I, that's what they kind of do. And I was like, oh, man, that's, that's too weird. I, I, that's unhealthy, I feel like. Um, but, I mean, Eskimos and Inuits have lived on basically meat and fat for that's how they've lived. And so... Um, the right kind of meat diet might be okay. Um, but if you really, I'd back to the thing, if you want to consider, go for it. Then eat less meat, eat no meat, you try it, go for it. I'd have a hard time. <laughs>